So, so this is uh, Matthew and uh, Chen. They're from um, the Keras team. Um, and uh, Matthew is a machine learning engineer um, who focuses on high-level modeling APIs. And he studied computer graphics during undergrad and has a master's from Stanford. And uh, Chen is a software engineer from the Keras team who also focuses on these high-level modeling APIs um, and also has a master's in electrical engineering from Stanford and is really interested in simplifying code implementations of ML tasks. Um, so we're really excited to, to have you here to sort of help uh, people understand kind of what Keras is, you know, maybe convert all the PyTorch diehards. Um, and before getting started, I just want to um, show people um, just quickly how they can ask questions. So if you go to the Hugging Face forums, um, you can click on the course um, category, and then you can scroll down to where we have Matthew Watson and Chen Tien. And here you can just post your questions and we'll be voting on them based on likes. And then and we'll... also the, the forums contain the links to the to the collab notebooks that uh, Matt and Chen is, are going to use. Cool. So with that, I think uh, Matt, you're first, right? Yeah, I'll be first. So we'll um, add your screen and um, yeah, we'll uh, see you soon. Okay, great. Um, yeah, let me actually start the presentation. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Matt and I'm speaking with Chen. We're both on the Keras team inside of TensorFlow. Um, and yeah, today we're going to be talking to you about NLP workflows inside of the Keras library. Um, so quick, just kind of plan for the day. I'm going to do the first part of this talk and I'm going to be just talking about kind of building like very basic models, very basic NLP models inside of Keras and showing showing what that looks like. Um, then I'll hand it over to Chen who's going to talk about kind of like pre-training and fine tuning using Hugging Face and Keras. Um, hopefully all of that will take about half an hour and then we'll have questions. Um, cool. So before I even dive into my side of the talk, I wanted to do two slides like super quickly just giving an introduction to to Keras to anyone who hasn't seen this before um, so yeah first off what is Keras um, it is a deep learning API um, and the kind of one sentence version of it is deep learning for humans um, but what that that means in terms of how we're trying to build our library is really centering it around like simple APIs that kind of reduce cognitive load as you're building up your models. So you can focus on building your models um, and really trying to focus on kind of a minimal number of actions that you need to take for common use cases. So basically you can get the Keras library and spin up a lot of examples very quickly, start to kind of explore your problem space very quickly. Um, that's a key goal with the Keras libraries. Um, and then another way you can think about it is uh, Keras is the high level modeling and training APIs that will come prepackaged with TensorFlow. Um, so yeah, that's Keras. Uh, and then I wanted to also introduce just two kind of basic abstractions that you'll run into over and over again with the Keras library, um, and that's layers and models. Um, so yeah, you, you might be you might have seen something familiar to this somewhere, but basically you can think of layers as kind of these Lego blocks of like common motifs that you'll see in many machine learning model architectures. Um, and with Keras, you can take these Lego blocks, you can combine them in a whole lot of expressive ways um, and then yeah snap them together and a model will be this collection of layers that kind of map from your inputs to outputs and the model is the going to be the thing that you can like train that you can save that has all these highly level apis available on it okay so that was a super super quick introduction to keras the library as a whole um, now i'm gonna do my my side of the talk that's on these kind of basic NLP models we can build with Keras. Um, and I'm going to be doing this with the sentiment analysis data set from IMDb. Uh, if you haven't seen this, I think it's like 25,000 reviews in the training data set that are just movie reviews, like three or so paragraphs of text describing a movie. And we're just trying to build a model that will predict, is this a positive review or a negative review? Um, and my, my goal in showing all this is going to first be to just kind of show some basic building blocks for Keras, um, working with text in Keras. Um, and then the main kind of the thesis of my side of the talk is going to be about this, this triangle on the right hand side here, which is that using Keras, you can hopefully go very quickly from an idea to an experiment to seeing some results um, and use that to inform kind of the next experiment you run 
in a nice tight loop. So we'll actually build up like four very quick models on, on my side of the talk. Okay, um, so we're gonna be writing this all in code. So let's let's start by downloading our data set. Um, yeah, you can see what we're doing here is we're first just downloading a, a bunch of plain text files in a couple directories, and then we're gonna use a Keras utility to load them as a TensorFlow data set. Um, and yeah, we're batching things. And when, when data is flowing through TensorFlow, you're gonna be seeing everything going through as tensors. That's kind of how TensorFlow works. I mean, you can see once we've loaded our data set and batched it, we have these batches of size 32, where every input, we have just a single input feature coming in for each of our examples, which is a string. I, I've truncated it here because they'd be too long to show reasonably on a slide, but think each string is, you know, many paragraphs of text, and then each label is a one or a zero. And a one here means this is a positive review, a zero means it was a negative review. Okay, so we've downloaded our data set. You kind of immediately hit this roadblock that you'll you know hit every time in NLP, which is how do we represent our data? Um, you're not gonna feed strings directly into any neural network architecture, so you know you need some sort of transformation of your input before you can even really start worrying about your model architecture. Um, and one approach that you can use inside the Keras library for this is the text vectorization layer, which we'll see in code in a second. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of our Lego blocks that's kind of just centered specifically around working with text input. Um, so it'll do a few different steps. They're, they're all configurable, but by default, it'll have a normalization stage where you'll remove punctuation and lowercase. Um, a splitting stage, and uh, I think the default option will just split on white space, so splitting into different words. Um, and then there's a number of different ways you can map from, from that idea of string tokens to some sort of numeric inputs for your model. And the, the simple model, the first thing that we're going to build, you may have seen this before, but it's called a, a unigram model. You'll also see this called a bag of words model. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a nice, simple thing we can build to start trying to guess if our reviews are positive or negative, where we're essentially just going to look at what words are present in a review and what words are not present in a review. So we're going to build up this vocabulary of the most common words in all our reviews first. Um, and then when we get around to kind of encoding each individual review, we're going to encode each individual review as this big, long array of zeros and ones. Um, that kind of aligns with our vocabulary that we've learned. And if you get a one, that means that word was present in your bag. Um, so the word movie is present in this review. We get a one at that movie index. Good is not present. We get a zero. Um, so that's the rough idea for the model that we're going to build. Let's look at this in code. Um, yeah, this is actually a complete training example for this Unigram model, but I'll try to break this down step by step. So first off, like kind of the overall flow that we're doing here is we're going to define this kind of symbolic input at the top, which is saying that we have, you know, our, our inputs are a single feature. It's a single element string that's going to be coming through. Then we're going to transform our inputs with some layers. It's two of these Lego blocks that we're going to snap together. Um, to transform our inputs to outputs. We build a model over our inputs and outputs, and then we train that model. Um, so that's, that's the rough flow. Um, and then we can step through these two kind of blocks here. The first, first thing here is probably the most dense, which is the pre-processing. Um, and this is where we're going to use that text vectorization layer we talked about. So first thing we're doing here, because we're for a second, we're just going to be working with our, our features and not our labels, is we're going to map over our data set. We're going to toss out the label just to give us the, the plain reviews alone in a data set. Um, then we're going to build our first Keras layer. And you can see when you're building a Keras layer, you normally will initialize these with some amount of configuration as to how they're supposed to work. Um, so this output mode multi-hot is where we're asking for this bag of words encoding of our input. And then this max tokens 10,000 is just saying, how big do we want our vocabulary to be? And we're saying we want to learn the 10,000 most frequent words um, in all of our reviews. And the way we actually learn the 10,000 most frequent words, you could actually supply a vocabulary yourself if you knew that and you had trained it yourself. Um, but you can also use this utility function that we have called adapt, which is actually going to loop over all of our features, all of our input reviews, 
and just learn the 10,000 most common words that we see in all reviews. Um, so when we've learned our vocabulary, we're ready to actually call the text vectorization layer on our inputs. Keras layers, when you want to call them, you can just treat them as functions and call them on your input. And that will give us this bag of words representation that we just talked about. Um, so from there, then we actually still need to build a trainable model on top of this. Um, and the simplest thing we can think of to do there is kind of just add a linear layer on top of this, and we'll just call it a day there. So we're going to, yeah, we we're mapping each of our inputs to this 10,000 long array of ones and zeros. And we're just going to learn a linear combination of all of those 10,000 values, pass that through a sigmoid function, and that's our whole model. Um, so yeah, just logistic regression on top of our bag of words. Um, yeah, so once we've done that, we can define our model. Uh, compile is a Keras function on models for just kind of setting up how your training is going to work. Um, so we can specify our last function here. We can say we want to track accuracy here. And then we just train for five epics. Um, so yeah, that's a complete code example in Keras. I encourage you to try this out in a collab if you'd like. Um, but yeah, essentially now we've we've built our first model and we've kind of made two design choices here. We've made a design choice around how we want to represent our input data as some sort of numeric input. Um, and then how do we want the actual trainable architecture of our model to look? And now we're now that we've built up our first example, we're just going to iterate on a few different ideas for how how we can build up our model for the rest of for the rest of my part of the talk. Um, so take one was what we just did, Unigram model. We're taking in our input reviews. We're mapping it to a bag of words where we're throwing out all of our sequence data. We're throwing out everything except just what words were present, what words were not present. We don't even care how many times the word film appears. We just want to know is it in the review or not. Um, so this is the exact code I showed you before. I've just kind of zoomed in on the actual meat of the model here because we're going to just be iterating on this for the rest of the talk. Um, but what does this look like when you actually run it? How does it perform? Um, first thing you can notice here is that it's a very small model that we're actually training. It's just 10,000 parameters because we're just learning a weight term for each term in our vocabulary, and that's it. That's the whole model. Um, and we're actually already doing pretty well. We've got 89% validation accuracy um, on a, a whole that data set. Um, so yeah, that was, that was take one. Um, and now we can start doing what hopefully Keras is going to make it easy to do, which is iterate on a bunch of different ideas, kind of explore the landscape of this little problem that we're working on. Um, so take two we can try is a bigram model. Um, and bigrams are just fancy word for a pair of words together. So if you're looking at this first sentence, this film is a bigram in this sentence. A travesty is a bigram in this sentence. And we want to build the exact same sort of bag of words idea, but we now also want to look at bigrams in addition to unigrams. And you could think how this might be useful already because not good, the bigram not good means something very different than the, the unigram good. So by adding in that little bit more knowledge of our kind of sequence data coming in, maybe we can build a more expressive model. Um, so what does this look like in code? We actually have to just make very, very small changes to our text vectorization layer. This is the pre-processing side of our model definition. Um, and we're just going to make two changes here. We're going to one, we're going to just bump our vocabulary size. We've changed from looking at only words to looking at words and pairs of words. So kind of our vocabulary space is a lot bigger. So we want to learn a bigger vocabulary inside of that space. Um, and then this ngrams2 argument is just where we ask, ask the text vectorization layer to also look at bigrams as well as unigrams. Everything else stays exactly the same. We keep learning our logistic regression on top. And that is our entire model. So if you ran this in code, you would see, OK, we bumped the vocabulary size um, from 10,000 to 20,000 parameters, um, just doubled our vocabulary size. So we've doubled our model size. Um, but we've actually bumped our accuracy. So now we're over 90% accurate on predicting whether a review is positive or negative. So that's great. It was a nice, quick, and successful experiment that we ran. Um, and yeah, now we'll try two more models on this side of the talk. Um, and the first thing we'll, we'll, we'll do for the next two models that we build is we'll, we'll switch from, we'll, we'll say, forget the bag. We're not going to do the bag of words model anymore. Um, and we're going to do 
this very common thing in, in NLP, which is we're just going to map each word to an integer index. Um, so we're keeping our sequence data in our pre-processing. And we have this movie was bad, this list coming in. We're going to map each individual word to an index. So this is the fourth index in our vocabulary. So this maps to a four. Movie is the first index. It maps to a one. And this output is going to kind of be our pre-processed inputs that we're working with for our last two examples here. Um, OK, so what can you do with integer indices for words? The common thing you'll do um, in most models is embed them. So we're going to take our input sequence. We're going to take our input string. We're going to map it to a sequence of integers. And then we're going to map each individual integer to a set of trainable parameters. So the index 11 will map to, in this example, four trainable parameters, same with 20. Um, I'm going to learn this big, long kind of horizontal embedding that you can think of where we're just pulling out individual columns for each word. And hopefully that learns like this rich um, but low dimensional space for all the words that we have coming in. Um, and then, because we're just trying to keep our models simple on this, this side of the talk, we're going to do the simplest thing we can think of with our sequence of embedded words, which is just average them together, not even try to do anything fancier than that. OK, so let's dig into this in code. Um, we still have our pre-processing block and the, the part where we apply our actual trainable layers. The pre-processing block is going to change a little bit here. Um, we're switching our output mode. So this is where we're saying we don't want our bagged model. We actually do want a sequence of integers coming out of our text vectorization layer. Our vocabulary size will move to 10,000. And then output sequence length, this is just something to keep this example simple, where we're going to say, for every input review, if it's less than 250 words, we're just going to pad this with zeros till it becomes 250 words. And if we get a review that's longer than 250 words, we're just going to chop it off at 250 words. And that'll just keep training simple here. Um, and then for the actual trainable model, we have a good bit of new stuff here. Um, we're using our embedding. So this is where we take each word and map it to an embedding for each word. Um, rather than for like on the slide I was showing, we're actually mapping to 32 different trainable parameters for each word. Um, we apply some dropout. And this is just because we're building a much more aggressive model with a lot more parameters here. So it helps to bring in some dropout just to avoid overfitting. And then we're doing this very simple, the global average pooling 1D is really all it's doing. It's taking everything in your sequences, in your input data, and averaging them together. Um, so we'll build that model. We'll still build a logistic regression on top just to map everything to one single prediction. Um, and that's our whole model. So if you were to run this, um, you'd see we've kind of exploded our parameter space a bunch because our embedding is now it's pretty big. We have 320,000 parameters compared to 20,000 for our simple uh, bigram model that we were looking at last time. And we've actually not improved our, our validation accuracy at all. We've gone from 90% with the bigram model to 87%. Um, so maybe not the best line of inquiry to keep going down further but at least this was a quick experiment we could run try out and see how it works um okay and then the last kind of model that we're going to build here is a recurrent one and uh, probably a lot of people on this talk have seen this before i won't go too deep into the details of how a recurrent neural network works or anything but the idea is we're going to build this lstm model do the exact same transformations as we were doing before, where we take our input sequence, we map it to a sequence of integers for each word. Each word maps to an integer. We map each integer then to an embedding for each word, which is hopefully this, this low dimensional but rich representation of each word. Um, and then we feed all of those into this recurrent neural network, which is going to be a trainable bunch of cells where we process each word one at a time and as we're processing the word, our, our trainable cell will have some sort of memory of what it's seen before. So hopefully the LSTM can learn some interesting things about our sequences coming in and start to remember what words it's seen a word, what words it's seen before a particular word that it's looking at in the sequence. Um, so that's the idea. What does this look like um, in terms of code? We'll, we'll keep our input representation exactly the same. We keep our pre-processing the same. We keep our embedding the same. Dropout, everything's the same, except we're just going to switch out our pooling layer with a trainable LSTM layer. And that will be it. Um, 
So if you ran this, this is our most expressive model. Um, yeah, we started with a 10K parameter model, and now we're at 336 parameters. Um, and we're actually doing the worst of all of them with our biggest model. Um, so we top out at about 86% validation accuracy. And you can see we're already really struggling with overfitting. Um, OK, so that was a just very quick introduction to what it looks like to build four different simple NLP models with Keras. And again, the rough idea and what we're trying to do with the library is to make it really easy to run kind of experiments like this, to come up with some idea for either how you represent your, your input text, um, but when you feed it into your model, how you pre-process it, or an idea for how you want to actually architect your model itself and go very quickly from that idea to some sort of results. Um, so yeah, that's entirely what we're aiming to do with the Keras API. And you can already see how it's it's given us some useful information into our, our problem here, where we found this nice sweet spot. The n-gram models actually turn out to be when you're not doing pre-training. And there could be a lot of reasons you don't want to do pre-training in, in a, a problem like this, um, where you you know we built a model with only 20,000 parameters that is going to be incredibly computationally efficient. It'll give you really fast inference times. Um, and it's already greater than 90% accuracy. So you can play with this more. Certainly, you can get to even better accuracy with, with n-gram models. But we've already kind of found this nice kind of sweet spot to, to go dig into. And you could try this. You could try more things, attention mechanisms, um, whatnot. But yeah, that was just a quick, quick intro to trying a few different simple architectures in Keras. Um, but yeah, if you did want to get to like, state-of-the-art performance, you'll want to do pre-training and fine-tuning. So for that, I will hand off to Jen. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Matt. I'll add Jen to the stream. Um, would you like us to do questions for your section altogether at the I end? I think we're going to just do questions at the end, if that works. Yeah, I'll do together. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Great. Matt. I'm going to go present here. So I'm just going to add. Uh, Chen's slides, great. So sounds good. So take it away. Thanks. Oh, cool. Uh, hi, my name is Chen. In the second half of the talk, I would like to demonstrate with real code examples on how to do fine training with Hugging Face and Keras. The main takeaway we hope you'll get from this talk is you will find it simple to do fine training with Keras and Hugging Face. We will use the same task as the first half, the IMDB sentiment analysis in the second part. And some background. For people not familiar with fine training, the idea is starting halfway towards our target. Instead of building a model from scratch, it's pretty similar to buying a house. Imagine you want to buy a house. Usually we do not buy an empty land and build a new house, but we buy a house and do the remodeling. The remodeling process is pretty similar to fine training idea. And in our IMDB sentiment analysis task, we can load a pre-trained BERT model and build our model on top of it. And what is BERT? BERT stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representations from Transformers. It was published by Google in 2018 and has gained great popularity in IOP community due to its strong performance. The explanation on BERT is beyond the scope of this talk. The main thing we need to know is BERT is very good at extracting representations from texts. Or say BERT is a good text encoder. Now let's take an overview of the model architecture we are going to build. First of all, we have the text loaded from IMDB datasets, the movie reviews. And we add a special token in front of each movie named CLS. We will come to the purpose of this token very soon. The first layer we have is a BERT tokenizer. As we mentioned in the first half, neural networks cannot understand string input. So we need to map this sequence of, of text into a sequence of integers. It's a job of this BERT tokenizer. The second layer is a BERT encoder. It takes in the sequence of integers and map it into a sequence of vectors. And here we only take the first vector, the vector for the CLS token, to represent the whole sentence. This is a common NLP practice. Basically, if we set up the model properly, the information of the sentence is going to be fused into the first token. Now we have the vector representation. We add a third layer, the fully connected layer, to map the vector into another space 
which is usually of a smaller dimension. We call that projected representation. This is going to be our final representation for input text. And the last layer is straightforward. We input this projected representation into a softmax classifier. The output would be the probability of this movie review being positive and being negative. That's all for the model. Before we look into the code, I want to pause here for a few seconds. I want you to think about one question. Like how complex do you think make the model work is like? Like how many lines of code do you expect to write? Or like how many hours do you expect to spend here? I want to pause here for like 10 seconds and let you think about it. Just give it a guess. Okay, cool. Now with the answer in your mind, let's look at the code. We have in total five steps. The first step is to load the tokenizer and pre-train bird from Hugging Face library as highlighted in the red box. If you haven't installed the transformer library, you need to copy and install to install that. And you pick up the model you want to use. And in our case, we pick up the distilled bird tokenizer fast and distilled bird model. And if you are not familiar with the input and output format of the model, you can play around with it. This is one sample output. And the second step is to load the IMDB dataset into a memory. This part is pretty similar to the first half, so I will not jump into details of it, but I want to pause here for a few seconds to let you look at the code. Cool. Let's go to step three. Step three is to tokenize the data set as highlighted in the red box. As we already have the data and the tokenizer, we can simply input the data into the tokenizer. The output like train encodings, validation encodings, would be the sequence of integers we described previously. And we do one more conversion. We convert the data into the format of TensorFlow data set, so it can be understood by our Keras model. A minor detail here, starting from this TensorFlow data set conversion, Every code is going to be based on TensorFlow and the Keras library. Now we are going to step four. Build our text classification model on top of the pre bird. To build a Keras model, you want to subclass the Keras.model class. And because we are taking in an, an external bird encoder, we want to add an argument named the encoder into the arg list of the constructor. And we explicitly set the trendable field as true so that the gradients can be propagated all the way towards the pre bird model. The red part is straightforward. We have fully connected layer, which is the self.dense one here. And we have softmax classifier, which is self.dense two here. And the dropout is a common practice to avoid overfitting. And remember to chain your components together by overriding a call method. It's very simple. You just specify the output of your previous module as the input to the next module. And we are almost there. Last step is to train the model. We want to first have a model instance and do some configurations, like what optimizer will you use and what's the loss functions you are at and some metrics you want to pay attention to. And you come out of it to get a model trained. And this is output of this model training process. We see that within two epochs, we arrive at a validation accuracy of around 92%, which is good. But we still see the overfitting problems. Like say, at EPO3, we see the training accuracy being 97%, but the value accuracy is only 91%. This is because even though the add-ons, like the fully connected layer is very small, but the bird itself is very big. So it has an overfitting problem. And that's all for the code. And we have shared this code in the forum I would encourage you to check it out. And especially if you're interested in beating this overfitting problem, you can use this code as a starting point and write a code on top of it. And that's all for the talk. We can go to the question session. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Chen and Matt, for your really nice talks and careful breakdown of Keras. Um, got a couple of questions here. Some are a bit technical. Um, <clears throat> so one question is, uh, Matt, you explained this uh, text vectorization class. Yeah. I'll just put this in the, um, here so we can see it. So, you know, it kind of looks like a tokenizer um, yeah. in some sense. And the question is, 
does it or Keras, the library more generally, allow users to kind of train their own tokenizers? So if they're trying to sort of train BERT themselves, um, can yeah. they do this? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Text vectorization is going to give you um, just kind of more basic tokenization. So it'll be good if you want to do like a character level tokenization or a word level tokenization. Um, but if you want like BERT, uh, most of these transformer architectures, you're usually going to want subword tokenization, um, which text vectorization won't do um, but there is a library you could check out called tf text um, i mean for one you could use the hugging face tokenizers for sure there's also a library called tf text um, which you could look at which will allow word piece and sentence piece kind of inside the tensorflow graph um, which there could be times where you want all of basically your transformations happening inside the tensorflow graph so tf text is a way you could do that awesome and speaking of uh, tensorflow <clears throat> the next question is uh People tend to use TensorFlow and Keras interchangeably. And I was wondering what the differences are or when should you use one over the other? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the way you can kind of, I mean, TensorFlow is a, a broad term for a large ecosystem. But if you think of the core TensorFlow APIs as being, yeah, kind of a lower level, Keras is a higher level training API layered on top of it. Um, so they're not interchangeable. You can use TensorFlow without using Keras, um, but Keras is usually the easiest way to build a model inside of TensorFlow. Right. Yeah, I think, oh, yeah, go ahead. Please. No, okay. I was just going to say, I think TensorFlow 2 kind of, if I remember correctly, Keras became kind of like a first-class citizen. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that, that, this is not the case in TensorFlow 1, but the TensorFlow yeah. 2, that's the, the new picture. I was about to say, in our initial launch of TensorFlow 2, we put Keras and TensorFlow together. So in that case, we have no difference between that because you, when you want to call Keras, you just do TF or Keras things. And we have split the code for outside, outside TensorFlow. The Keras repo is now separate. But mainly speaking, like for people building model, the first place we go to is still using the Keras because they have it's like it has the layer and the model abstraction there. It's more closely aligned with the building model process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree. Like if you want to, you know, build an experiment quickly, you, you just want to just get done fast. You don't want to, you know, get into the low level, you know, graph and stuff. But I, I think, you know, from my old experience in TensorFlow 1, using the graph was really great for performance uh, reasons. Right. Sure. Hmm. This is maybe more of a philosophical question. Um, so since the transformer architecture took over NLP, do you see a good use for previous models like LSTMs? Because I think, Matt, you showed a, a pretty nice example, and you kind of answered this a little bit with this uh, you know, 20K parameter or 90K parameter model, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it totally depends on your problem set. But in the example we are looking at, like this, it's a very small amount of data. And you might be worried about being doing pre-training because maybe you you know it's a lot of kind of extra data to bring in. It's hard to validate. You might be worried about bias. Um, you might be worried about computational efficiency when you're doing inference. So in this example, the LSTMs actually weren't a great way to go down, but the n-gram models, which are some of the like simplest things you hit in like chapter one of any NLP textbook, are actually really really performant. And it's good to remember they're out there if you do want like a really simple model that you can train. That's surprisingly quite effective. Yeah, I totally agree. I think like one thing we sometimes forget is like, you know, transformers is not like the first thing you should reach for maybe like if, you, if you're building like a real NLP application, naive Bayes with engrams is like a really strong baseline. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, you'll often find that the extra complexity, you know, cause you some problems in prod. Um, let's see. So this is maybe a question for Chen. Um, so there's a lot of optimizers out there these days and is Atom really all we need or should we be looking at other optimizers? Because I think you mentioned in your code when you were building the, the model.compile, you had Atom. And yeah, I know that like there's like a history of Atom and Atom W and all these kind of things, but I'm just curious, like just generally, what do you think about the space of optimizers and yes. where, where, where this is developing? Oh. So that really depends on what you want. So if you want to build a state-of-art model, Atom is definitely not enough. But if you want to play around with a, with a model or want to try some development work, I would say Atom is good enough. But one thing there, even if you are using Atom, you may need to look at something called Moving Average Optimizer, which is inside TensorFlow Atom. It's just like a wrapper optimizer but you keep the moving average of the model variables so that it gives you some boost in the performance. That's something you want to look at. 
But if you're looking at building some state-of-art model, maybe you can check out something like SEM, SAM optimizer, and some other like advanced strategy. I, am, I would say like short answer is LM is still good. But if you are looking on something very advanced, you can think about some other approach. Awesome. Let me just have a quick look to see what else we have here. Um, okay, so another question we have is in the chat. Give me a sec. So the question is, um, can layer-wise learning rates help uh, during fine tuning when it comes to BERT models? Uh, the short answer is, I think it can, but it will be really hard to configure that. Probably you should try a lot of times before you can actually get the model converged. Because if you are fine tuning with such a big model, it's very error prone. If you set up like some layer using a wrong learning rate, maybe of some problem, but definitely with, at a high level, it should help with the fine tuning process, but probably not in the aspect of doing the, the, the speed of making this work, but just the like performance, the final performance could be better. Yep, yeah, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, and this is another final question maybe for Matt. I think in um, your talk, you, you were explaining, you know, you had these learning curves or the validation mm -hmm. um, accuracy and so on. And so the question is, can you expand a bit more on this idea of training loss and validation loss? And if the validation loss starts increasing, can we conclude that the model is overfitting? Um, yeah, if your accuracy is going down or your loss is going up on your validation set. That, I mean, it, uh, things can be noisy and you want to look at how much noisy, but I mean, in a lot of our, uh, with the examples I was showing, we weren't doing any pre-training. So we were just looking at this very small data set of 25,000 input examples. Um, which is, it's really, really easy to fit, a, overfit, at least when you're looking at, at NLP problems. So yeah, I'm pretty much all of all of those simple models I showed. If you you keep training for a while, you know, notice that you start to be overfitting a little bit. Awesome. And maybe I can ask the last question. It's a, it's a personal one. So um, like, you know, working at Hugging Face, I, you know, contribute to some of the open source libraries we have here. And there's always this kind of like um, trying to keep an eye out on the future of like, you know, where, where things are going. So for example, you know, Transformers, there's a lot of developments outside of NLP. And one thing that um, Hugging Face is interested in is like, you know, looking at vision and audio. And so you, you sort of have to make some design decisions about your library, how it evolves and how do you make sure things are backwards compatible. And I was kind of curious, like in the Keras team, like where do you see like the sort of like the future? What are the interesting, like say domains or let's say even APIs that you find particularly exciting and maybe you can shed some light on, on where, where the library is going. Matt, do you want to talk about like Keras and LPY doing? I think. Yeah, I think, well, I think one, I mean, there, there's a, a number of, of things that we're looking at at the Keras library. Um, I mean, I think one thing we always continue to look at, which uh, separate from, from this kind of side of the talk is just how do you easily distribute stuff? So I think one, one place we continue to have a lot of work is like you, you've written some simple training example and you want to like, and as quickly as possible, take it to running on a bunch of machines. Um, doing a multi-work setting, we're always working on that. Um, but yeah, another part that we're looking at a lot is, yeah, just kind of bringing in more high-level abstractions for, for NLP and CV, um, mm -hmm. kind of giving more kind of of these Lego blocks that we kind of give you, giving a lot more that are specific to those applications to hopefully make it a lot easier to get get up and running with kind of more complicated NLP models and, and CV models, computer vision models. And one thing I want to add about distributed training in TensorFlow is we are trying to make it like even more seamless. Currently, you and if you write this distributed code in TensorFlow, you need to call some strategy thing. I think there is some ongoing efforts trying to trying to make that disappear. Like you are going to write the same code, which is called dtensor. Like I think it's going to like bridge the gap between like standalone training and distributed training, and hopefully that will be much easier in the future. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be like awesome because I, I kind of feel that like where we are now as a field, especially in, in industry is like, there's like a kind of like, you know, different age of like, finally you get GPUs at your company. And, you know, like for example, like, you know, in my old job, I was a data scientist and you could get one GPU and you had to share it, you know, with like three data scientists. Um, but you start to see that like now that companies are really investing heavily, especially in NLP 
that this idea of like distributed training becomes really important because, you know, being able to iterate fast is, is in some sense, like the way you make progress on your problem. And yeah. I, I think at the moment, there's a lot of like pain in, in like, you know, if you, if you think to yourself, okay, I've got my super nice, say, Keras, you know, lines of code, you said it's not so much code. And now suddenly I want to scale out to like, yeah. you know, 20 GPUs and then, I, I feel like the abstractions are not quite there yet. Like, at least for me, like, I feel like it takes a lot of work to, to build out to that. Yeah, definitely an area where look at. And yeah, I mean, Keras is really all about that uh, idea. The faster you can iterate is the faster you can like come up with interesting ideas. So we definitely want to mm -hmm. be doing that in the multi-worker setting. Too. Awesome. So that's it for the questions. Um, and yeah, thank you once again for taking part in this community event. Um, yeah. it's, I think it's given people a really great primer for um, how to train models in, in Keras and TensorFlow. And we have uh, a TensorFlow scapegoat, as we say, at Hugging Face, who's, you know, responsible for building all the API part of Hugging Face Transformers. And he's super excited to, to see more people um, using this. So thanks a lot. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thank thanks a lot for joining.